Welcome back for the fourth and final season of Beyond the Venue podcast. When I started this project almost four years ago, I had absolutely no idea that I would be the one navigating Beyond the Venue by returning to the classroom. Before diving into my second year as a doctoral student, I figured it was a great time to wrap up this podcast by offering my listeners a variety of perspectives and experiences of life in academia. This semester, you'll be hearing from my friends, colleagues, classmates, and more, all of whom I've had the pleasure of working with since my return to Temple University a few years ago. Let's hear from them now. My guest today is my friend, classmate, colleague, Amy. How are you doing today, Amy? Hi, I'm great. How are you? Fantastic. We're just dealing with the soupy summer weather here in Philadelphia. Um, Super excited to have you on the show. Uh, So Amy and I met in the fall of 2023. Um, We were two of 12 students who were in Tim FC's Philosophical Foundations of Educational Research. Is that is that the right name of the class? Did I get it right? Sounds, sounds perfect. Yeah. Uh, we just refer to it as Tim's class. Um, so talking a lot about philosophy, um, fascinating guest speakers, and just had a very engaged and enthusiastic professor who really helped put the imposter syndrome at bay with reminding us that you belong your thoughts and feelings are valid. Um, and you know, it, it absolutely loved that class and it, it made a lot of sense as we were going through it because when I was taking a non-matriculated class the year prior, like I was familiar with several folks who were taking his class and it just seemed like they were, it was just such a community. Um, and I feel like we really walked away with having um, 12 completely different human beings thrown into this classroom, different backgrounds, different experiences, um, you know, two beautiful human beings from, uh, the, the college of, of dance. Um, and so, uh, it was, it was great. And also I loved what he did. I've never seen anyone ever do this in a classroom, but the, you could not, if you didn't say your name before you started talking, you weren't like, it was almost like you didn't exist. So it was kind of like this fun game of like, Amy, Amy, say your name. Mm -hmm. But we all knew each other's names by the end Mm -hmm. and it really facilitated community. And so I always wonder, it's like, would that translate to undergraduate? Right. right. So I know I loved that too. It's a, so as difficult, I feel like, as the readings were, like, how did you feel? So we had a lot of philosophical readings to do. Like, how did you, how did you feel about it? <laughs> it was hard. It was really hard. I would, I would probably say that was the most challenging class that I've had in the sense of kind of opening my mind, I guess, mm-hmm. um, and sort of taking other perspectives that I probably wouldn't have otherwise, which I really, really appreciate um, and didn't expect. And also my favorite class because of a lot of what you said, just the community building and sort of the sense of like, oh yeah, wait, I, I, I'm I, okay here. Like I, I belong here. And um, I think I really needed that more than I even realized. So I think like he has such a great way with that. And he has such a great way of like helping facilitate us to kind of supporting each other too, that I feel like I walked away with like, yeah, 12 new or 11 new friends, um, that could have gone very differently. Like, oh, they're lovely people. And I'm never, you know, that'll never speak to you again or something like that. But, um, I don't know. It was just such a cool little community we had. But the readings were so hard (laughs) because, you know, other than like maybe one or two weeks where I read, you know, Skinner and sort of like the behavioral, um, behaviorist philosophy, um, that I'm like pretty familiar with other than that, outside of that, like nothing really fits well with my (laughs) like established set of beliefs for like kind of how I view the world so it's interesting but it's also just like mind-bending and um so it's like a huge amount like just the quantity in general each week but then also to have like 
have it be so challenging to really wrap my brain around was really hard. Um, I loved, I mean, I would struggle so hard with the reading, get so frustrated. I'm like, this makes no sense to me. But somehow in class, it would all make sense because of the way it was almost like, a form of group therapy where we're all talking it out and sharing like, okay, you know, what did this mean? Or I found this interesting. And so it was really helpful because I did, I would feel ridiculous every week. I'm like, that was hard. I don't understand it. But then I would somehow find myself like being able to talk about it because we were all talking about it out loud. Cause Tim would, he'd facilitate, but it was just very much like, a two and a half hour conversation about whatever, what, whatever that, you know, whatever the the subject matter at hand was. So, um, yeah, loved it. So I, I definitely us- miss that. Like in the spring and especially the summer where like very minimal interaction with other students, I miss, I miss that so much. <laughs> it's tough when you go from having an experience like that, where it's a hundred percent conversation based like 100% lecture based and you're mm-hmm. just being lectured at as opposed to getting to have conversations and so um i think it's it's very um shaping of my teaching style that you know mm-hmm. when i ultimately like have my own classroom and have my own course material that like i would love to do more conversation based and like less lecture based yeah. um but it also comes with like a, like making it a psychologically safe space to yeah. where students are able to feel vulnerable enough to speak up because yeah. a lot of times in undergraduate classes, you know, you ask them questions and they just stare at you like you have nine heads and you're like, I'm, I'm just asking simple questions about empathy or leadership or teamwork yeah. and this shouldn't be that hard. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely it's I would say it's a it's a big skill to have, I think, as a teacher to be able to not only ask the the like good questions that facilitate that, but also, like you said, kind of set the tone and establish this. Also, I mean, there's some things like having 12 people in a class versus 30 is going to be mm-hmm. obviously different. And like you said, if if you have a bunch of like undergrad freshmen, their first experience, like outside of high school, like it's going to obviously play into it. But um, I don't know. I just could could see that class being really painful if it wasn't <laughs> taught that way. Um, so especially for like the philosophy type content I just I think that's you know such a beautiful way of of having people feel comfortable and like not afraid to to ask a dumb question or something like that so absolutely it's great well speaking of things that I know absolutely nothing about um we're gonna circle back to Skinner and you know this uh is a behaviorist is that yeah (laughs) yep So obviously that's, that's your line of expertise. (laughs) Um, So we really look to you, Tess and Katie to um, get us educated on Skinner. But um, Amy, can you, can you share with our listeners, you know, your backstory? How did you end up um, in the program that you're in specifically at Temple um, here in the College of Education? Yeah. So I am a board certified behavior analyst. Um, and have been for several years, I kind of lost count by this point. <laughs> um, but I've been working since as a behavior analyst since I think 2006, I want to say. Um, it's been a long time. Um, and our field has grown in so many different ways. It's gotten a lot bigger quantity wise. Um, and also we've kind of, it's a, it's a baby field, as we like to say. Um, so the the certification that I hold has only been around since I think it was 1999 or 98 that it was established. Um, still today, there's people even within the field of special ed. Um, it's becoming more rare, which is probably good. But there's still people who don't even know what I do or have never heard of a BCBA or anything. So um, just to say that in case, you know, you or anyone listening is like, what is that? So you're not alone. Um, it's a, a lot new, of acronyms, always yeah, a, lot a lot of acronyms, acronyms in the academy. I know. I know. Um, so really what, what I do, what behavior analysts do, um, we 
kind of under these assumptions that we talked about Skinner and these sort of theoretical assumptions that fall under the philosophy of behaviorism, which is basically to me, just to kind of sum it up (laughs) in really simple terms, um, there's obviously a lot more complex ways of talking about it, but basically it's a way of looking at the world and and human behavior, actually all behavior really, um, as kind of um, able to be changed. Like it's sort of this hopeful, I think, way of looking at it where, you know, we're not born it, although of course there's some biological factors that are going to make us more likely to do certain things or become or, or have certain qualities, that kind of thing. Um, but that a big or the bigger part of it is really kind of how we interact with the environment. That could be people, places, um, computers, uh, anything really. Um, and kind of our little reactions throughout life that actually build different skills or different ways of thinking and Um, talking and all those kinds of things. Um, So although it's way more complex, our behavior is way more complex than that. To me, that's kind of like the bird's eye view is like, it's this hope that, you know, any, any behavior, any um, way of thinking, any way of believing is able to be changed, does follow these sort of like laws, um, meaning that there is a way that we look at it as from a behaviorist standpoint that like things that um, we might want to change about our own, the way we we act and the way we think or the way we believe we can. So again, to me, it's like this ability to change like throughout your entire life. Um, Some, some easier than others, some behaviors easier than others. And also like, you know, babies you can you can shape up behavior because they don't have a long history of of um interacting with the environment whereas you know by 40 you do (laughs) so you're a little more set in your ways but there's still an ability to change so yeah I think like I don't know I feel like that kind of shines light onto most of my like social beliefs um about society and people in general like there's good there we can always do better and there's always hope for kind of improvement and progress and stuff like that um so that's really what I love about it um as a philosophy and then as far as how I got into it so um I actually went to undergrad thinking I was going to be a special education teacher kind of runs in my family. Um, I did some like summer jobs and volunteer work throughout like high school and college and stuff. So that is just kind of what I was going to do. And then I got to the the part where it was like, okay, try it out in, in you know, during undergrad. And I was like, no, I don't want to do this. <laughs> so I kind of froze um, and didn't pursue that. And when I was asked, like, what was there? I mean, because I'm, I'm actually uh, working with Tim FC right now on a study uh, called Why Not Teaching? And so why, who, why folks who maybe at one point in time were interested in teaching um, did not go the teaching route. So, I mean, for me, yes. it's like, I would assume money. Like, I don't know how much teachers make, but I feel like the stress to money ratio is just unacceptable. But yeah, these interviews I mean, have been fascinating of, you know, hearing folks experiences. So were there were there like particular red flags or was it just the whole experience of just like, no, ma'am, shut it down? <laughs> for no, me. it was I adored the class when I was in the classroom as a student, meaning like learning about the the different strategies and how you support different learners who have different um, disabilities or styles, needs of, you know, supports and things like that. I loved that part and I was so excited. And then when I got into the classroom to student teach, um, I felt like, I mean, I I didn't even make it to the point where I was getting paid. (laughs) So yes, that would be a barrier. But you know what, honestly, I, none of my career has been, unfortunately, (laughs) has been, um, you know, like geared towards making any money because that's just oh, not, not in the field. I know. <laughs> Same yeah, thing over know, here. You know, it's just, it's, yeah. Um, 
it wasn't really where my mind was, maybe to a fault, because now I'm like, oh, that would be nice to have like a retirement plan or (laughs) 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 but (laughs) um, I remember when my husband and I were like 12, 13 years ago, we're on a date and um, like sort of early on dating, getting to know each other. And he was like, how like, And I I was basically trying to like brag a little bit, but not, I'm really bad at it still. Um, But I was like, basically trying to say in like humble terms, like, I'm good at, I'm good at my job. Like, this is, this is what I'm made to do kind of thing. And he was like, oh, how do you know it? Like money? Like they keep giving you raises or, or like, (laughs) no, you know what? And I like, didn't even occur to me that it's like, oh, people like actually, that's how people know (laughs) in like other fields. In my field, it's like, they tell me I'm really good. <laughs> they give me more responsibility. <laughs> we had a similar, um, we had a, we had a similar uh, situation in, in our relationship. Uh, my husband and I both graduated with our master's degrees in 2011 and started dating shortly thereafter. And I finished with my master's in tourism and hospitality management. I would go into work in the beer industry. He would get his master's in statistics. And so the running joke when we started dating was I'll keep beer in the fridge if you keep money in the bank account. So um, (laughs) it's it's a a little different these days. However, he's the our studio genius. So he's the one that um, was able to help me so I could help others with our studio for quant one and quant two. So yeah, that's I mean, major bragging rights. That's a a big deal. (laughs) Like, oh, this is what you do all day. Okay. Not for me. Let's stick with qualitative <laughs> research. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So, um, so, so what I were you to- doing? Yeah. Like right before, oh. like when, wh- I guess, like, what were you doing when you made the decision to apply for this PhD program? Okay. So, um, I was working as a behavior analyst since I had my son in 2018. I had done, I haven't worked like a one full-time job. I've just kind of pieced things together. Um, in, in our field, behavior analysts are pretty, like there's a not enough qualified behavior analysts to go around at this point with the growing rates in, especially with insurance coverages for people diagnosed with autism or children really under 21. Um, and so the need is so great. There's just not enough of us to, so basically that's to say it's really, I'm lucky in that sense. Cause like, it's easy to grab jobs wherever, like consulting here and there. I've done lots of consulting in the Philadelphia, um, the school district of Philadelphia, um, some like behavior health organizations around the city or around the surrounding counties and stuff like that. Um, it's just a quick, quick, easy way where you're not like significantly committed um, so it was perfect for me to be able to, especially during COVID, to be able to be home with my son. You know, he's napping and I can go to a, a virtual session kind of thing. So that that worked out really well. Um, so I was doing that. And then with him, um, you know, getting older, he just turned six. So um, I was like, I'm like kind of itching to get back in the field, like a full time where I could really like kind of dig in. Um And had always, always wanted to. So I was kind of halfway looking and um, had always, always wanted to go back to school. I mean, my kind of joke with my husband has always been like, if we win the lottery, I'm just going to be in school for the rest of my life. And just like, just taking, you know, random classes and getting all different PhDs or whatever. (laughs) Just, I just honestly love it, especially if there's like not a pressure there. Like Mm -hmm. when I was younger, I wasn't like the school kid. I, I, felt I was like consumed by the pressure of of doing well and stuff so I I didn't do great um and I didn't like it at all so now it's totally different I I love it especially being in the special ed program is just so so fun for me um so yeah and then I've always kind of so I've always wanted to do a PhD I saw kind of a last minute random um, flyer for the grant that I ended up being that I'm on. Um, and I just thought like, if, you know, it's now or never kind of like do it or like this, if this is kind of, it was kind of the perfect, just the wording of it kind of matched my, like, so it's like something about evidence-based strategies 
um, which is a big thing to me, a big thing in special ed that we talk about, but that we don't do super well <laughs> in my experience, um, like in the classroom. And to kind of get back to your other question, um, I didn't have the words for it then, but when I was doing my undergrad in special ed, um, what ended up happening was I felt like I was on an island without any support and real instruction from someone who knew what they were doing to tell me, you know, people would come, you know, once every couple of months and do observations and give me feedback and stuff. But it was, it didn't feel like it was this like supportive, like, let's grow you into a teacher. It felt like, here, we're going to check this off the list and then you'll be ready to like go. And so part of that for me felt so scary. Like I was in a classroom with kids with behavior challenges, things that I didn't even know. Like I had no idea. I just thought they hate me or I'm horrible at this. And, um, and I mean, to be fair, I was not doing great at it. I just didn't have the, the tools that I needed. And I think that one of my big passions in both like talk, we'll talk about it probably with my dissertation, but also just like in general, some of the research that I've done while being a clinician um, relates to how to better support the professionals, whether it's, you know, teachers or therapists or parents or anyone really who are supporting the kids. Because I think that we have a lot of really good research, but that kind of research to practice gap in that area is so, so massive. Um, and it's detrimental. And I, I truly believe that that is like, if not the biggest, one of the biggest causes of kind of our like teacher shortage, especially in special ed. I think the more specialized we, we need to get with, you know, kids with extensive support needs. So kids that are, you know, not vocal communicators who engage in high rates of like aggress aggressive behavior or self-injurious behavior or who are a threat to themselves or a threat to other people's safety. Um, you know, it's really, really complex strategies that we have proven in the lab or in, in a controlled environment that work really well. But it's just not realistic to do that in a classroom with other kids with, a, you know, all of the challenges. So I think like that's really where kind of my career and my passions for research kind of um, collide and where I hope to kind of go. Um, sorry not to jump ahead. It kind of goes with the question of, of why I, I am not a special ed teacher um, from 20 years ago. And I don't know that we've gotten much better. <laughs> I mean, I'm in some of the schools going like, you know, there's such a high need for, it's sort of the cycle too. There's mm -hmm. such a high need for teachers. So we do these like quick programs, which are, you know, we do one at Temple where, um, where we take basically like teaching assistants that are already working in the schools. And we say, let's fast track you through this quick program to get you ready and certified, emergency certified to be a special ed teacher. And like part of that sounds really great and it's really appealing. But I, I have to wonder, like, what are we missing? Now, I went to a four-year program, again, 20 years ago, and I still missed the, so it wasn't the fast track, and I still didn't feel like I got what I needed. So, you know, there's a lot of variables that we could probably look at and do better. But I think some of the Band-Aid solutions that we look at um, or that we already have implemented in our in our country um, are not working. And I think we we know that now it's been years and years of shortages. And I think they keep growing, if I'm not mistaken, every year. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, and what, you know, I feel like you can't have this conversation without also saying like the overarching kind of cloud that's hanging there too is like, how much do we value teachers and, and education and this, the system that we've built in our country? Like, so, I mean, there's so much there <laughs> to talk about, but, you know, I, I can't change that at least in a four-year program or <laughs> so my focus is, is like maybe little things that we can do better um, to give like myself 20 years ago. Like, I think I would have been a pretty good teacher if, if I had the right training and, and support, you know, and I like, I kind of grieve that in a weird way. Cause I, 
that was like a dream of mine. And it felt at the time, all I, all I knew was like, I failed. So, you know, here it's easy. Now it's easy to just look back and go, okay, there's so many systems. Again, that behaviorist viewpoint where like all these systems and environmental variables at play that kind of set me up for failure. Um, but of course, as like a 22 year old, you're like, I'm the worst. I failed. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm moving to California. <laughs> That was, I mean, I, with the co-op program at Drexel, I was like, I don't want to do anything with corporate America. This is all terrible. I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. Um, so I was encouraged by, you know, when I've had undergraduate students, I'm like, give people ridiculous answers that they're asking you what you want to do after graduation and you don't know, because it's totally yeah. fine to not know, because right, right. you can go back to school in your 40s and go get a PhD. Like, that's what the cool yes. kids are doing. High five. That's right. High five. Um, so I'm curious, like specifically, so um, if you were a full-time PhD student, you get funding in like different capacities. And so that's what affects your um, admission into different programs. So like for me, um, for uh, two years, I'm going to be funded through an NF NSF grant. So it's the National Science Foundation. Um, and so working with a specific professor at Temple as a part of this grant, um, and then the next two years I'll be funded, I'm assuming directly through Temple as they, I will receive my stipend, et cetera, um, by being a teaching assistant. And so, um, it's nice to be able to be doing like the research while I'm doing my two years of coursework. And then when I do my dissertation work, that will be, um, I'll go back to teaching during the day. So with your particular grant that you received, is it for your full four years or are they just um, providing you with this grant while you do your coursework? No, it is for the full four years, which is beautiful. Um, so it's the first two years are coursework and then um, the second two are you know, dissertation. Um, which is, I think, I think pretty, from what I know, pretty generous. Um, generous, I don't know, that's a relative term, <laughs> I guess, but um, <laughs> uh, especially looking at my bank account, I'm like, it's not, so, you know, but um, it it is, I know, relatively speaking to, to cause, because I've looked over the years, like, oh, maybe I could do it, because I also, that was kind of another piece of, like, the puzzle for me was, like, I still have undergrad and master's um, degree loans. And so I'm like, I can't, now I'm saving for my kids college. Like I can't, you know, feel good about paying for another set for school. Like I just, I can't do that. Especially because also in my field, if you're looking like black and white, having a PhD doesn't necessarily mean, or definitely doesn't guarantee that you're going to like make more money, like in some fields maybe. So, um, it's really more about like a passion and, you know, it's almost almost hobby kind of <laughs> um so I guess you could look at it like that so yeah um so it's a great it's a great grant it's through um OSEP which is the Office of Special Education Programs um through DOE the Department of Education um so it's a federal grant and it's four years there's a stipend um and then there's some like other opportunities that you can you can like you are contractually allowed to work a little bit here or there. So, you know, I still do some consulting on the side just to pay some bills and stuff. Um, uh, so along with the coursework, it's um, between anywhere between 10 and 20 hours of um, like research assistantship per week. Um, and which is like the fun part. I, I love that so much. Um, that's like, why I'm doing this really. Um, and my um, advisor, Jason, Dr. Travers, um, has some really like great experience that, you know, that was kind of another thing where worlds just, or the, the stars aligned, I guess, um, that he had come to Temple within the last few years. Um, I had known of, of his research and um, like really connected with it and stuff. And um, like kind of, know knew of him through like other colleagues that know him kind of thing so it just worked out really well I think our styles are really um like they match well <laughs> um I love his 
his feedback and like hearing him, him kind of, you know, mentor and stuff. So it's great. That's awesome. Well, yeah. I um I kind of touched uh really quickly on the dissertation. Like, do you have um a topic in mind or are you still um kind of playing around with uh with what's possible? I would say both. I, I definitely have an overarching topic, but um we have we've discussed kind of around and around um with my advisor, I've discussed it with um, other colleagues and just kind of there's a lot of different directions I could go um, and a lot that needs to happen. Um, so yeah, we've kind of started. Um, so it's overall kind of looking at how we prepare special education teachers. Um, specifically, I really like um, to to look at the I guess we call it coaching at Temple. Um, so the d- sort of direct you know, observations and giving feedback and stuff. Um, because again, probably um, that connects with my own experience again, 20 years ago, like thinking of what I could have used and stuff. Um, and then also just looking at like, as a behavior analyst, we've, we've done a lot of research in our field. I, sh- I mean, they have, I haven't done any of it, but <laughs> um, about the very specific ways to most efficiently and effectively teach people how to interact in sort of complex situations, how to keep themselves safe, how to get, you know, all, all types of different situations, um, and how to teach children with really, really like extensive support needs, how to teach those children best and how to teach the professionals to teach them best, if that makes sense. So that's the part where my my brain lights up is the, like, there's definitely better, we know better ways on paper. Um, we know from pretty extensive research of the best ways to do it, um, but we don't really do it. And there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of barriers. So um, I think looking at those barriers, trying to kind of pinpoint them and then find ways of making them more efficient. Can we do some things virtual? Can we do, you know, I don't know, looking at kind of resource sharing and just different um, strategies. So I guess my talking about dissertation, it's a couple steps. Like we are putting an IRB um, proposal, hopefully this next week, um, to do a study in the fall, kind of like a, a... little mini version of what I will, or maybe a, like the preempt to my dissertation, <laughs> um, just to look at, can we ch- sort of improve teacher, pre-service teachers? So the teachers that are taking coursework and doing like student teaching this coming year, so they're not actually certified yet. Can we, you know, teach them really complex skills that they're going to need in the classroom and kind of how to navigate those things and and how how much can we get away with like pulling that support back where they still kind of perform and learn and stuff like that to make it the most efficient um, sort of package, I guess, would be my ultimate goal. Um, So hoping this fall we'll kind of get our feet wet with like one, um, one little study and then kind of continue from there. No, that's great. I think um, so uh, for our listeners, IRB, so that's the Institutional Review Board. So any, um, was it, I think the, the definition, like you have to, if you're working with sub, like human subjects. Humans, yeah. Yeah, if you're working with human subjects, um, you're required to go through um, the, the IRB board where you fill out forms um, so that they can uh, make sure that you are following um, ethical behaviors. Um, so that's, I, I know that that is a very common (laughs) because every, every research project has to go through it. Um, so unless you're doing a a meta analysis where you're just looking at a bunch of articles and writing a summary on them, um, when you're dealing with humans, as we obviously do in the college of education and human development, um, IRB is a necessity so they can come back and ask for more specification. I know with your, you have to include like your interview protocol, if there's interviews involved. Um, So I have not done one on my own yet, but I have been a part of multiple. um, 
IRBs so far. So um, good luck. I'm excited to, to hear how this develops because I think that's great that you're doing like a pilot study before, you know, let's, let's see how this goes, like grow from there. Um, that's, that's awesome. And you, you know, and I think the timing is great too. So excited. I'm really excited. Well, the, the next question I, I have for you. So, um, you have a six year old, um, full-time student taking classes, doing this research assistantship. You know, we're encouraged to do studies, which you're obviously doing um, on top of our research assistant ship because we got to build those CVs uh, right. <laughs> while we're in this four year program. So, you know, like kind of personally and professionally, like how did this last year go for you? Because obviously that's a major transition um, from being at home. Um, you know, I, I guess I don't know how much. Um, like physical uh, um, consulting you were doing versus like virtual. Um, but obviously like this was a big shift. And so um, how was this past year for you, like personally and professionally? And how do you kind of like juggle all of it? Yeah, yeah, it was wild. Um, it was a huge transition. I feel like the the biggest transition was like the emotional side of it for, for me and my son. Um, we're, <laughs> we're pretty attached. Um, you know, I think like, you know, it's both of, we're very similar, um, in, in our personalities. So it, it makes sense that, um, but also just like, I feel like a year and a half of his life with kind of COVID shutdowns and then like not being, we actually couldn't, find him a spot in a, in a preschool for a while, like right when things started to open up and stuff and it got, it got chaotic. So basically from like a year and a half old when COVID first hit until he was three, when he went back to just like part-time care. So, um, and he's an only child. So it's like just, you know, me and him and my husband in the background, basically <laughs> coming in and out. But, um, I mean, yeah, so there's some attachment maybe issues there. I don't know. So anyway, um, I do think that we won, me and my son both 100% needed this kind of like kick to, <laughs> to, to have some separation. Um, this summer has been a little bit hard because we're back to kind of like, um, you know, other than here and there where I can find help or camps and stuff. Um, he also has some, so he's diagnosed with autism and ADHD. So, um, you know, it's not quite as simple. Like he is not, he needs more support than like a typical kids camp can provide. Um, which is why, you know, we haven't done that. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot there, but I do think like, I love the relationship that I see, um, with my son and my husband that has kind of been like, I mean, they've always had a good relationship, don't get me wrong. And they're very close, but there's definitely been like a different level of bonding. I feel like because, you know, two days a week, like I would drop my son off at school at, you know, seven 30 and then not see him till the next morning, which we have never done anything like that because, um, you know, I would be, I would have class and like night class. And so, um, for me personally, and like my, I guess, professional, but really just like the personal level, I loved it. I mean, I, it was super hard, um, that transition and just kind of getting back to like using my brain in a different way, <laughs> which is really hard. Um, when, you know, you, your brain has been like momming for <laughs> mostly for, um, even like the consulting work that I've done. Um, since my son has been was born it's it's never been like challenging in a way that um forces me to use my brain like I have had you know had to the last year or so um it's been awesome and I love it but it's it was it, it was really hard to like okay like I really have to find ways that you know help like get my body moving at certain times in the morning and get my energy up and then only have this amount of caffeine and then, you know, kind of fueling my body the right way because, um, my brain it is impacted by it. <laughs> and for a long day too. And I'm, I'm right there with the brain. Um, the 
I wish someone would have told me like the summer before you start a PhD program, just read. <laughs> and I, know, right? I just wasn't thinking about it. So I, you know, I took classes, not matriculated. I've been teaching as an adjunct. So like I was reading and engaged, but I took the summer off to just travel. Cause I was like, this is the last summer I have of like quote unquote freedom. So I traveled and watched everything on television. Like I I don't even know what I watched. I have no idea. Um, So I feel like my brain was just kind of like a pile of mush. And then (laughs) taking three classes for that first semester, the amount of reading that we had to do was just, my brain was not ready for it. And so I've been, luckily I like, I've had like studies over the summer so in addition to my research assistantship, I've had other things I've been involved in. So don't get me wrong. Still done a little bit of traveling. Still watched a little too much television. But I am like, and I'm trying to be a lot more cognizant with um, August coming up to like, okay, we need to work our brains. We need to, we need to. <laughs> Get a little workout. <laughs> um, which yeah. you're also involved in a writing group, which I feel like that is something um, like, I feel like I should probably start taking advantage of. Um, tell me, can you tell me more about like your, your writing group? Cause I've heard other professors yeah. talk about this and encourage this. Yeah, that's where, um, that's where we got it. I think one of the guest, um, speakers in Tim's, class, Tim's class. Yeah. So I don't know if you recall, but, um, I don't, I, I remember when it was set, like, I remember the moment it was said, I can't tell you who it was or whatever, <laughs> what the topic was. Um, I know I heard it there though, but yeah, so we had kind of talked about it, Tess and I, I think, um, had talked about it a few times. And then when spring started, spring semester, we had a class with um, all five actually there's six, but five of us are on the same grant. And then, so, you know, Katie, Tess and I are all like going into our second year. And there's two other women who started the year before us on the same grant. So um, we've kind of been all connected for um, during the spring semester, especially we took a course together. Um, And so we kind of threw it out there to them. They were into it. So we started, we just put it on our there for like every week, just like, I think before the class we were meeting in person, so we're like, well, maybe just like a half an hour before we'll do a quick each week, one person or, you know, just try it out. Um, and then it ended up kind of morphing into, um, so I guess just for context, we were, the class we were taking was like a practical um, kind of issues and, and things in academia, um, not issues, but like skills and, um, you know, learning to write a better CV, um, grant proposals, stuff like that. So, um, it was really great. And there was only the five of us, plus there's one other person in it. So there's six of us in there. And so it was really like, we got to know each other again, a really good, um, kind of practical, like learning experience was just great. Um, one of the weeks we read, it happened to be, we didn't read Skitter every week. <laughs> Not all of these people are, are behavior analysts or, or behaviorists in general, but um, the one week, of course, that I connected with, um, we wrote, we read this, um, like really practical based again, um, article that Skinner had wrote, uh, like mid career about, he wrote it basically to like graduate students and early career researchers on kind of how to improve their writing behavior, um, their researching behavior. And so one of the things he said, which I'm so simple and I was like, Ah, like, but it's like basic behavior management 101, like create a schedule for yourself, be consistent, like just kind of, you know, setting yourself up to do it, like same time every day, same, you know, I was laughing because I'm, I'm thinking it was probably in the maybe 50s or 60s. Um, so he had young children, but he had a wife and I'm sure that like, yeah, nice, like, <laughs> like way to show your privilege there a little bit, but, but the concept I like. So, you know, I've always been a morning person. That's my brain is, is on in the morning. Um, especially if I, like I said, I kind of, I know, I know myself enough to know, like I got to get some movement. I have to have a little bit of caffeine. 
um, not too much. I have to, have, you know, so like I got myself into a little bit of a better kind of morning routine um, where I could have some quiet time in the morning. And even if it was 10 minutes, 15 minutes tops, like that's literally what I was doing. Um, so here's my writing time. And then I also kind of expanded, I think it was in that same article um, or maybe another one we wrote where it was like your writing time initially might not be writing. It might be like, like preemptive things that would lead to writing eventually. So if it's a research thing, it might be just looking for some, from some uh, literature. Yeah. Yeah. It might not Mm -hmm. be actually Mm -hmm. writing, you know? Um, And then there's something I can share that article with you if you want. I can't recall it. I was going to say, I was like, I feel like I need to read this. It's really great. It was really great. um, Because it was just like these little aha things that you're like, it's not, it's simple. Like, why did I think of that? But like, you know, writing in the sense of, um, like, do like, don't use a full sentence at first, just like kind of, he didn't say word vomit, but that's what I'm going to say, <laughs> but like, get it out. And then like, you start to kind of shape it, and mold it and stuff over time and you do little spurts at a time. And so, yeah, it was just, it was just like little pieces of advice like that. So at the same time we had, we had, um, read that and talked a lot about those little things in that class, we were starting this writing group. So once a week we would get together before the class. Some people would jump on virtually if they couldn't make it. Um, obviously we're really like relaxed. It wasn't formal. Um, and then it started to kind of morph into, um, also including reviewing, um, journal articles, like as a peer for the peer review process. Um, so we got to, um, start by like each one of us, kind of one at a time every month or so we get assigned an article from um one of the journals that that um the uh PI for our um grant uh Dr. Boyle is uh a co-editor for um it's called uh the journal of special education technology um so he asked hey if you guys or, or maybe we asked him, um, can we kind of group peer review, like one article so we can kind of talk it through together. And um, so we did that. And that kind of became our like, writing group for a while um, with the idea that eventually it's going to turn more into like, let's talk about our like independent research that we're doing and bring it to the group and talk about it. But um, it really worked well for kind of growing those skills of reviewing an article and looking at, you know, the quality indicators and um kind of I don't know hearing other people go through their learning process on it is always helpful for me so so yeah that was that's cool. awesome yeah I would definitely love to read that article because I, I think um you know especially over the past year I feel like I've struggled to like what is the best way to like write a lit review you know like I feel like yeah. there's gonna be a lot of expectations moving forward that I feel like you know, obviously we're writing a ton of papers. Um, but like, even like for my research assistantship, it's like writing, a you know, a, a lit review for our ARA proposal or, um, uh, I got to participate in writing for a manuscript for a study that we have out for, um, uh, hopefully it's going to get published. Uh, but, um, so listeners, you'll be hearing more about that um, in a couple episodes because I'll be interviewing uh, one of the other women I worked with on that study. Um, and so it's nice that you have other grownups who are in charge. Like you've got these, you know, longtime PhD um, doctors that are able to like go in and take what you wrote. Because um, when you have a bunch of people who are like all working on something that you've got to kind of put it into one voice. And so it's exciting to be able to participate, but at the same time, you're like, is this complete trash? Like, is this? <laughs> it's, yeah. You know, a lot of times for even my school assignments, I'm like, this is the worst thing I've ever written in my life. And then the feedback is like, this is outstanding. And I'm like, is that- I, yeah. I don't I, like I'm following my rubrics and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I appreciate the encouragement, but I just, I don't know. And I, I think one of the things too is like getting critical feedback 
is super helpful because this is what we're signing up for a lifetime of because yeah. that's all you do is try and get published, you know, doing research and try and pump out those publications and you're just going to get rejections and um, reviewer feedback. So, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm getting a lot better with the initial um, like reactions and like the defensiveness and, you know, the, the clutching of the pearls when you're like, Oh man, this is a lot of, this is a lot of comments, but helpful, super helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard on your ego. And like, I know, you know, I know that like all else equal my, like that reaction to critical feedback and so, and by critical, sometimes I mean like not, you know, still very kind or still like in the best way possible, I can still be like, I don't know, like, no, I thought I was like nailing it or, you know, so it, it's hard. It's not, and that's not even like, that's just during the learning process. I think it for me will be really hard when I'm like, okay, I have a PhD, I know what I'm doing. And then I get kind of this slap of <laughs> like denied or something, which obviously is going to happen. Like that is, that's a reality of, of what we do. I mean, I was, um, I don't want to even say helping, but I was privy to a grant that was, um, like huge. It was like seven, $8 million grant. It's big, um, uh, department of education for across, um, like several universities and stuff that my advisor was working on in the like early spring semester. Um, and so you know, just kind of looking through what he was doing, which is just so intense and crazy. And just like two or three months of his life was like really devoted to this. Um, and, and we didn't get it. And, you know, it's, he, he's like, oh, this is the percentage of, of things, you know, I still have a good percentage. So I'm not, you know, and I was just like, I'm devastated. I didn't even do the work. Like it was just so much of his like energy, blood, sweat and tears, you know? So, but it's like, that's, how it goes that's that's this job so yeah that's also why we build community too so we can support each other it is so I think it's um you know we we understand what one another is going through and so I'd um you know hoping to continue to build community amongst uh us fellow doctoral students um so we can continue to um you know share laugh love cry (laughs) Better as we move through this, I love that insane I'm process. So, so pleasantly surprised, honestly, in this in this program with the support that I have found in the community. Um, so I didn't expect that, although it's like I think necessary, or maybe the reason I like it, I like like the program, you know. So it's it's pretty great. Well, and it it helps me too because you know that's the when I had my first. Um, conversation with Avi, who's my faculty advisor, uh, when we had that, you know, preliminary, you know, November 2022 conversation, when I was basically asking him to be my faculty advisor, so I could work it into my PhD application. um, It was tell me your backstory. And so I was like, okay, I can do that. And then he just said, lean into all of that, that um, because hospitality has been such a big part of my life. And it's it's always going to be me. Like I'm just always going to be a little miss hospitality that having learned lessons of owning my own business and knowing how crucial having community was to ensure that I'm supporting as well as like feeling supported that I feel like it was a very easy thing to do. And so I love how Tim set the stage for that. And then, um, you know, I've kind of been allowed to like help foster that. So I'm really excited to see how Dr. Johnson's new role as the Associate Dean of Student Success, as we continue to like work with her, like how we can continue to like build community and support each other because we, you know, we don't have cohorts. So, you know, you got lucky with like your little squad Yeah. at the same time, <laughs> you know, there are only two of us in educational psychology who are taking classes. And yeah. so, um, 
the other woman actually works for the college of ed. And so it's just taking them part time. Um, so it's like, I don't have like an ed psych squad. And yeah, yeah. again, because I took those non-matriculated classes, all of everyone else from Tim's class went on to take quant one together, right, um, right. which I had taken the year prior. So, which is why I was like sending you, it's like, here's unsolicited advice to try and help get all of you through this class. Because this I is mean, what I, I would try and do <laughs> with my class the year prior. So I was like, all right, I have a live in our studio expert. Um, so I'm happy to help in any capacity that I can. Um, so yeah, so it's it's uh it's gonna be a wild ride for the next couple of years, but um, you know, very grateful for for your friendship and um hopefully we can have some more lunch dates um throughout the throughout the semester. Yes, let's make um, so, that happen. <laughs> so we're getting towards the, the end of this episode today. Um, uh, you know, I think the the most important thing for us to talk about is, you know, our mutual love of Puerto Rico. Um, yes. <laughs> so I, you know, made it a point that anytime we had long breaks from from school to to travel. So uh, Thanksgiving of 2023 that we have that whole week off at Temple, the entire week of Thanksgiving. Uh, so we went to Puerto Rico. And since I had shared that with the class, you're like, oh, my husband is Puerto Rican. I have notes. Um, <laughs> and so your advice like absolutely helped. And uh, you had been to, is it Rincon? Rincon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rincon. Rincon. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we had already my booked, way of saying. <laughs> we had already booked our our stay in Rincon, and you're like, oh, you have to go to these places, and we just had the most fabulous time. Um, I don't think I've ever been sunburnt for Thanksgiving before, but it was totally <laughs> worth it. Um, so you know, my final question for you is, you know, what's what's your favorite venue? Because I, I did was it Eagles something or was eagle involved in the name whatever that beachfront restaurant oh, where you yes. could watch the sunset yes no i had to i i would have to go back and reference my notes for names because as you i think when, when you first asked me in class i'm like i have not oh, been in a minute place. there's a there's a place that's blue and <laughs> so but yeah i i tried to keep notes because my husband you know he grew up born and raised there and um he knows that island like the back of his hand. So he's not, but he's not good at, I mean, even here, like in our own neighborhood, he's like, yeah, let's go to that place. Or like, we don't, he doesn't use names and um, <laughs> he doesn't remember any. So yeah, I would always like, okay, take a picture. And then I'd like caption it basically in my notes. Um, but there's so many great places, I think. So again, he knows that island so well. Um, and like growing up there, he, well, so after college, he went to college in New York and then moved home. And um, he would take these like Sunday drives around the island. He had a Jeep. So it was like, just like perfect. Uh, I don't know. When you, when you get to know him, you'll, it'll make sense. But, and just see him riding around, like top off, like just, that's his thing. No one talking to him, his own music, like diet coke with him that's his dream um and so he would find these like places that he had never been to even um just like really off the beaten path type things so the first time and and every time we've gone other than with my son because you know it's a little different when you're traveling with sometimes. the youngster yes yeah yeah we'll get there but um not when he was like in a you know in a crib still um we played it safe with the resorts then, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, when we go, there's this one, um, I might've told you because it's kind of on the way to Rincon, but can't remember. It's called crash boat beach. Yes. Crash we did end up going Dine. there. Mm -hmm. Oh, you did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you love it? We did. Did you jump it's... off here? <laughs> I, so I don't like sand. <laughs> Okay. Don't like well, never mind. <laughs> um so like I'm it's funny because my husband and I both like love listening to the waves. And so like I oh, absolutely cool. love a good like beachfront stay. So you can like or like being next to the water. Yeah. Um, That's my favorite part for sure. The so sound. like we definitely had the opportunity to do that in Rincon, um, which is why I got so sunburnt, was taking um 
just like camping chairs and sitting on the beach. Love that. Versus like, I I don't love going into the water Hmm. at the beach. And also the place that we booked in Rincon specifically, it had a, a gorgeous swimming pool. And so take advantage of the swimming pool. Then go down to the beach. It was it was a yeah. win-win. So I prefer I did a, not a jump pool, in the water. <laughs> but Crash Boat Beach had um, an outdoor restaurant, yeah. and so you know, got some drinks and delicious ceviche, and just hung out and people watching. <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing right now. <laughs> yeah. Although right now it's probably unbearable there. Um, so hope, we're hoping to make it there this this year. Maybe maybe Thanksgiving will do. It's a great time. I mean, it was still, you know, 90 degrees um, yeah. and pretty hot when we were there. But um, I was concerned that I was going to get sick when we came back. And sure enough, because <laughs> going from 90 degree weather to 30 degree yeah. weather, like it just shocks the immune system. It so, does. Uh, yeah, it yeah. happens to me too every time. <laughs> well, Outside of Puerto Rico, do you have another favorite venue? I do, um, which is funny because I meant to look it up and I'm like, I don't even know if I if this still exists anymore since COVID because we haven't been. But our wedding, we I mean, we got married in a synagogue, but then our um, like party afterwards was um, a restaurant in like Old City called um, the Positano Coast. It's still there. You know, is it still there? Okay, good. It's still there. We used to go every year for our anniversary and I would just try to, I just, obviously it holds a lot of like sentimental reasons. I love it. But, um, but I just love that, like, you know, Greek isle, island, like vibe or Italian coast vibe. Um, And I really, really want to go. I've never been to the Positano coast and I've always wanted to go. Um, And so that felt, like when you're there, if you've ever been inside, it's, you feel like you're there. <laughs> um, and so, and it was just, I, I just love the, they used to do a really good happy hour. Um, and you can kind of sit like on the second floor, they have balconies and stuff and, and you just overlook, you know, really cute little neighborhood. So, um, I don't know. I love it. it feels kind of like you're a little bit like you're in Europe for a minute. <laughs> um, so that was really, that was my my number one that also reminded me like we haven't been in years we need to go (laughs) well it also sounds like you found the perfect happy hour spot for us to get together next time (laughs) love it well amy thank you so much for joining me this afternoon this has been an absolutely delightful conversation as always um and i wish you the absolute best of luck uh with this upcoming fall semester thank you too mg so fun catching up Have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode from the fourth and final season of Beyond the Venue podcast. New episodes of this final season will drop on Fridays throughout the fall semester. Follow Beyond the Venue podcast on Instagram for details and updates about each episode and stream all four seasons on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks so much for your support.